Hello, I'm Tara Bravazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 203. The relationship between reading and writing. Oh, I'm excited. This is a fantastic request and really got me going in terms of the research. And look, there's a lot of requests that feed into this one and a lot of them are about reading. Students often ask me, how many items do I need on a PhD bibliography or reference list? How much reading should I be doing? So all of it's about metrics and quant. Well, it's quite difficult to quantify how much you should be reading. And really so many of the requests I receive about reading and writing are about how do we make the PhD sausage? And what I mean about the PhD sausage is that students do reading, they do their research, they do their experimentation, they do their field work, and all of that meat and stuff gets pushed through the system and becomes a sausage at the end which is your PhD. Now the question is, what does that sausage look like? What's its texture? How is it put in place? And what I would say to you in terms of the making of the sausage, it's very important that none of us underestimate the importance of writing. And look, I have heard a lot of colleagues say to me, oh look, writing in a PhD doesn't matter. Wrong. So incredibly wrong because remember I read thousands of PhD examination scripts and there is no doubt about it if the examiner thinks that the writing is sloppy they ask questions about whether or not the research is sloppy if the writing is rushed the examiners probe if the research too is rushed and <laughs> if too much of the thesis is written with other people in the form of refereed articles that are not properly reconfigured and embedded in the rest of the thesis, then examiners worry about research integrity. And they will put it in their report. If they don't know who's written that part of the chapter, they will ask the question. And the challenge we have in the Australian system is in systems around the world, they can ask that question in an oral exam. So I've done that when I've had a bit of a doubt about authorship in a chapter. I've spent a fair amount of time in an oral exam going through paragraph at a time to see if the student has expertise in that area. But in the Australian system, there is no oral exam. So you rise and you fall by the caliber of that script that you present to the examiner. So this vlog therefore explores the relationship between reading and writing. And look, while this vlog appears very normal, well as normal as we get, actually I turn it back on itself in its final third. Oh. So what I wanna look at in that final third is what is actually going wrong in academic writing and how you, yes you, can use your reading and use your reflection on that reading to transform academic writing internationally. Hashtag no pressure. So I had a lot of fun doing this vlog and I just loved the research. I found it incredibly inspiring. Thinking about reading, thinking about writing and their relationship in higher education. And it is a truism that there is a connection between the reading that someone does and the writing that they produce. But it's a truism. What is that relationship? What is the interplay? In terms of literacy and literacy theory, they are different activities. Reading involves decoding text. What that means is you see a little squiggle and you say, all oh, right, that little squiggle is an A or that little squiggle is the number seven. So it's decoding squiggles. <laughs> That's what reading is. Writing involves encoding text. So picking up a pen or a pencil and making a squiggle that others can read, or doing a particular combination on our keyboard and creating something that people can understand. So we encode text. But therefore, what is the relationship between encoding and decoding when they're very different actions? Well, in antiquity, those activities were linked because the apprentice writer began with reading. So a good writer was moulded by other writers through 
reading. Now, like a lot of these earlier models, the 60s man changed everything. So in the 60s particularly, a new way of thinking about reading and a new way of thinking about writing emerged through composition. And the techniques, the andragogical or indeed pedagogical techniques deployed to enact particularly composition was originality. So what was important? Originality. So all the focus was on writers configuring an original voice. That was the focus of attention and composition. So teachers were aiding students wider modes of expression through writing. So the writer's voice became the priority. So you can see how reading sort of has gone a bit. Yeah. So you'll notice that a lot of these models of writing refer to fiction. And that's cool. Fiction's great. But this has meant historically that the writers of non-fiction, of which academic writing is a very large part, have been neglected. We have the sort of how-to guides, how to do it, but the models and theories of it are really undercooked because the focus has been on pretty meaningless words like creativity or originality. These words mean so many things. How can we make sense of them? So academic writing and academic writers have bumbled through our prose. And the PhD <laughs> is a really important moment because how you understand, how you were taught what is academic prose really happens in a doctoral program. Now, most writing, including the entirety of the PhD experience, is not actually about experience. You're not writing about your experience. You're writing based on reading. You're writing based on deep research. And from that sausage meat of reading and research, we have to make something that has the right texture and the right shape that it is recognized as, you've guessed it, academic writing. And without reading, we don't have anything to put in a PhD. But further, Professor Steve Graham, wonderful scholar, hi Steve, from Arizona State University, conducted a fascinating inversion of the relationship between reading and writing. This changed my life, by the way. He showed through research, empirical research, that students became better readers when they wrote more. Wow, boom. He stated, quote, if you teach writing, you get better readers, end of quote. So if we write, it improves our understanding of research and reading. Boom, fantastic. And that's why, by the way, I make sure that my PhD students write all the way through their thesis. So rather than writing it up at the end. So the writing up at the end model, so I'm in the writer, are you? The writing up bit at the end of a PhD, that was used as a model right the way through a lot of the 1990s. But the research now has had a bit of an impact. And can I say, when people were writing it up at the end, it was a disaster. One of the reasons theses took so long to do up to the year 2000 was that students had forgotten how to write. So they'd done their research, gone on field work, done all their experiments, great, 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 and now they're writing up. And of course, they haven't written much in two and a half years, and they've forgotten how to write their own name. So isn't that going well? So what happens now? is that we write all the way through. Write publications, write conference papers, do blogs, do our, our milestones. So that's why we're asking you to present the work you do in milestones so that you can continue to write. And that was the way to keep student students' hands into writing. And I've always said, and it's been the mantra of my life, we learn to write by writing. And our writing improves how we read. So keep writing, keep reading, do them concurrently and at the same time. Okay, there are lots of reasons we deploy this strategy. Firstly, it reduces stress. So you're not writing up at the end. When I say writing up at the end, I start to get stressed. It's like, oh, no pressure. I've just got to write 100,000 words in six months. Good luck with that. But it also chunks, chunk, chunks up the work for students so they don't get overwhelmed. But we improve the writing through the candidature. And as we've seen by Steve Graham's research, the great thing about writing is it doesn't just improve your writing, it improves your reading as well. 
The relationship between reading and writing has been studied empirically and some great research happens there, but a lot of the research starts with early childhood education and moves through primary education. We need a lot more attention on reading and writing for experienced researchers, but also for PhD students. There are some theories, and those theories have become some really instructive models that we deploy in our work. But can I say, the nature of literacy, all literacy skills, is that there's active forgetting as part of it. So think about it. What do you remember about learning to read? Probably all you remember is learning the alphabet, so you're singing the song, and k uh, t, so phonetics, actually spelling out the word. Yeah? That's probably all you remember from reading and writing. You probably get much more excited thinking about holding the pencil and then moving to cursive and then being able to use a pen. Okay, so the physicality of writing is what we remember. And you know, like we iron clothes, we forget how we learned how to iron and all the stuff we burnt doing that. So skill mastery involves actively forgetting how we gain those skills. So the nature of reading and writing relationships is that they're often taught separately, but what the research is showing, they do have for us a developmental relationship. And the nature of that relationship is changing through time. Both reading and writing certainly are language processes, and while the teaching of reading has a really large body of literature, it's really unexplored in thinking about the role of writing and reading comprehension. That's a big area for the future, I think. And at its most basic, I think, we've got two questions that are structuring and propelling our work. What does reading do to writing ability? And how does writing impact on the way that reading is undertaken? So writing about our research summons a thinking space. Mike Wallace and Alison Ray referred to this as critical reading, end of quote. Now, I always get a bit worried about the use of critical as an adjective. Let's just throw critical in front of things, right? Critical gaga. Let's just throw critical in front of things. And it's a bit meaningless. But they argue quite strongly that critical reading is the way we assemble evidence to improve our thinking about the world. So when we read, we are modelled into what makes great research and see how evidence is deployed to verify claims. But critical reading goes one step further. We interpret the reading of others to develop our research. Wow. So this type of critical reading allows us as researchers to identify assumptions, find the errors or the issues or the strengths and the evidence that has been deployed, and also, yes, assess the reasoning. This is the task, or what's often called goal-oriented reading, big supporter of goal-oriented reading. So before we read anything, we come into the party going, what do we want to get out of this? So before we open a book, before we open a screen, before we look at a photocopy, we go, right, well, what do I want to get out of this? And speak that goal, write that goal down before we go into it. So we always have to remember that we are doing writing, we are enacting writing, so that it is read. And the goal for all of us is to move our reading levels up the scaffold of difficulty. So as a PhD supervisor, I have to move you as quickly as I can from textbooks and encyclopedia. I won't even go to Wikipedia. I can't manage or have to be medicated. But we have to move you from these more generic, pretty basic sources to refereed literature as quickly as we can, have a scaffold. And it's always important to remember that we see the world through the reading that we do. How inspiring is that? So when we do high quality reading, we see the world in a completely different way. And that's the gift of research. We see the world through the research of others. How amazing is that? So I've talked a lot about the positive relationship between reading and writing as an iterative cycle, if you will. And I want to use the end of this vlog to enfold back on itself and show you what's going wrong and how we're doing research and how we're doing reading and yes, particularly how we're enacting writing. Because let's be honest, the bulk of academic writing is dreadful, <laughs> very boring, 
redundant clauses, ambiguous, predictable structures. Oh, here we go again. There's another title. Oh, dear. So the final part of what I'm doing now is I want a new way for you to think about your reading and your writing. So you've got the capacity to intervene in business as usual in academic writing. Because, look, part of what a PhD program's about is fitting you into the genre of academic writing created through what we read. And what I want for us now is to look at the pretty well dodgy legacy that generations of academics have left us through their writing. We have amazing academic writers, absolutely phenomenal academic writers. Think about Chomsky, think about Henry Giroux, amazing scholars, inspirational scholars. But the reason they're so inspirational is they're unusual. <laughs> so while I've argued very strongly through this vlog that there is a complex relationship between reading and writing, I want to unsettle that relationship for you now. So what I want you to do for me, your old Dean, is I want you in every single reading that you do, don't read for content. Well, should I say, don't only read for content. We read for content, that's what academics do. But I also want you to read for form. Read for form. Look at how the scholars you are reading write. And I have a little booklet. And I advise you guys to start doing this too if it's useful. And when I do any reading at all, everything I read, articles, books, the whole lot, I get the content, I take the notes, that's great, but I take just two minutes at the conclusion of finishing that book or that article and I just jot down what worked in that article or that book. What made it interesting writing? Might be, well, that was an interesting word. Hadn't come across that word before. Wow, that was an interesting way to pace an argument. Oh, look at how that conclusion took place, or a really great title. So I just take a couple of minutes and think about form as much as content. And you also write down interesting words too, and I think that's great. Why don't you vocabulary? So start to reflect on form, and that will improve your own writing. So every day, read for content, read for form, and reflect on what makes great writing. This is important because PhD students learn to write from their supervisors and from what they're reading. And this is not always good. Because <laughs> think about it when someone uses the phrase, oh, that's very academic writing, or that's a bit academic. So what does this cliche mean in terms of describing a writing style? Well, it's dull. It's predictable, it's monotonous, it's verbose, it's distracted from daily life, it's unclear, it's specialised. Not good. But of course some of these characteristics actually are great. We need academic writing to be specialised, we do. We need it to be at the top end of town in terms of standard, absolutely. We need it to be excellent, we need it to be advanced. But it can also be clear, provocative and passionate. This matters to you, and let me tell you why. And I'm going to use a quotation from an incredibly famous article from the New York Times Book Review in 1993 from Patricia Nelson Limerick. And the article was titled, what a title, Dancing with Professors. It's, it's available online, it's a great article. And she stated, quote, and I'll just, the first sentence just always makes me weep with laughter. Quote, I do not believe that professors enforce a standard of dull writing on graduate students in order to be cruel. <laughs> they demand dreariness because they think that the dreariness is in the student's best interest. Professors believe that a dull writing style is an academic survival skill. So what we have here is a chain of misinformation and misunderstanding where everyone thinks that the other guy is the one who demands dull, impersonal prose. <laughs> End of quote. Genius. So is your writing dreary? Is your writing dull? Are you writing this way because you think that's how academics write? Time to change this record. 
let's end this imitation of style and this conformity of style and ask what is happening in academic writing because the weird thing is what we think is happening in academic writing is actually not happening in academic writing let me give an example empirical data set so we think of the sciences as impersonal and empiricist but actually in the sciences hard sciences between 82 percent and 100 percent of articles in medicine, evolutionary biology, and computer science use personal pronouns, I, me, we, 82 to 100%. And only 40, 40% 40 of historians use I, me, mine, we. So the humanities, high humanities, uses cool third person. Computer science doesn't. So what we think is happening in academic writing is not actually happening. So what is the future of academic writing that I want to summon for you and you can summon for us? Firstly, it is the importance of experimentation rather than conformity. We discuss the importance of experimentation in our content, so we need to experiment with content. Why not form? So if the way of writing or an interesting, innovative way of writing suits your argument, why not experiment? Why not move outside of conformity? Use clear and precise language. And that means short sentences, reduce your use of adjectives, use examples, illustrations, stories, avoid jargon, vary and widen your vocabulary, and use an active rather than a passive voice. Give us a research arc. Tell us the story of your research. Research does not have to be abstract. Make your research come to life. So do not assume that the way that we have written academic research in the past is the only way to write academic research. As Helen Sword stated in her fine book, Stylish Academic Writing, quote, there is a massive gap between what most readers consider to be good writing and what academics typically produce, end of quote. And she refers to this as disciplinary monotony. Helen Sword studied great academic writing that was highly cited and the characteristics of it were clear eye-catching titles and subtitles, humanising the researcher, powerful opening paragraph, big punchy questions asked, the capacity to hook the reader, broad range of references, grey literature, broad range of literature to demonstrate reading, avoiding abstraction, strong articles, and have the story arc in place so that the readers stay with you through the journey. So remember, when we're talking about academic disciplines, so often we submit to the disciplining of writing in our academic lives. And this means that we enact these habits that are often unconsidered. Indeed, the formal training we receive as an historian or a biologist really begins and ends with the PhD. So we pick up and we perpetuate the bad habits of our supervisors. So how can you transcend the mediocrity of your research training? Well, Helen Sword stated, quote, PhD students are not quite as powerless as they believe, end of quote. Learn what you can from reading each article in your research and take that extra couple of minutes and think about how it's written, what's worked well, what's been problematic, and how can you do better. And suddenly you then transcend your training, you transcend your discipline, you find new audiences, and yes, you pick up those citations. And it also allows great audiences, different diverse audiences, to find you through innovative titles, and readers will stay with you through the story that you have to tell. I wish you love, light and peace. Tia.